Right, okay. Well, I think we're coming up to two minutes past, which is my traditional time to start. So, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us again in my Lincolnshire lockdown loft. Uh, I'm Alistair Meeklejohn, and this is the Dare Dallas Valuations webinar. And believe it or not, it's the ninth one today. I need to be, need to be careful about the numbers because I've got it wrong in the past two. So I'm fairly sure it is the ninth one. Um, I must say again, as, as Rachel said, we've had a fantastic response to the quizzes and, and all the webinars that we've done. So thank you ever so much for all the lovely, fantastic responses that we've got. And uh, I hope they've been informative and they've been fun. So We do you love your feedback, guys. Feedback is so important because it points us in the right direction. And again, this week's um, sort of topic has, has come from a viewer. Uh, so thanks for attending today. But also, again, it's because we've been asked questions. So if there is a topic that you'd like us to concentrate on, then do let us know, because obviously that's really important. And again, if there's ever any questions for your clients, again, shout. That's what we're here for. Which actually, which, which leads me on to a good point of saying, actually, we're going to, once all this kind of situation is over, we are going to continue with our webinar series. It might not be every week, but we are going to try and still put out content with regards to lots of different things that you find interesting and you feel you'd like us to talk about. So that's all good. So as you can see, joining me today is Rachel Dare. And we're going to be talking about the, uh, the article that we put out this week that really was covering um, what you need to look for in, in an insurance valuation. And we'll, we'll come on to some other points at the end of the webinar. But starting off, Rachel, so it might seem like an obvious question, I suppose, to many, but why do we need an insurance valuation? Well, I, I think the need comes from two areas. One is obviously an insurer and a broker need to understand actually if they're writing a risk, what that risk is. And then from our point of view, we need to advise the client about value. You know, um, we do valuations for all different areas such as insurance, we do probate and we do divorce. And we obviously um, do uh, market values as well. So when we're doing evaluation, first of all, we need to understand what it is that we're doing a value for. So I think it's a surprise. It, it really is a case, and I see it in a lot of situations where people come and say, oh, well, I've got a valuation. But I think the purpose, I think, is, yeah. is, is such a critical thing because people, a lot of people don't realize that there are a, a plethora of different purposes for evaluation. And again, I think that goes down to on the article that we place that we put out this week, you must be able to see on your valuations that you receive what that purpose is. So from my point of view, um, our valuations carry on the bottom of each page what the purpose of the valuation is for. If there is a difference, then it will be mentioned within the description. Um, Again, always ensuring that what the purpose is, is fully visible. And again, the certificate page will clearly state the purpose that the valuation is being done for. And it's really important because if you're getting that wrong, I mean, we see from, from again, when we're doing valuations, clients will say, well, I bought it from auction, so I want to replace it at auction. That's fine, as long as the broker is aware of the uh, consequences of buying at auction and how that can affect the client replacing. So, you know, and again, are they using the hammer price to insure it at, or have they made sure that they've built in the premium and the VAT? And does the insurer have a copy of the receipt? Because so many things can affect it. Um, I always remember years ago I was involved in, and this goes back, gosh, to the 80s, there was the sale of um, Fanny Craddock's Kitchen, for those viewers that still remember Fanny Craddock. And um, it was, it was her, the contents of her kitchen. So things like uh, wooden spoons, you know, that you could buy in a regular department store for, you know, probably five pounds, were suddenly making hundreds of pounds because it was hers. And again, it goes back to the Jordan trainers that sold. Um, well, exactly, exactly, yes. Yeah. So things affect value, and it's so important that when we're valuing, it's involved in that. 
I mean, that, that actually leads me quite well on to, to the second point that we actually made, I think, in that article, when we actually talk about what a valuer actually has to consider when appraising an item. So really, it's not just about the item. In many cases, it's, it's as much to do with the person that owns the item. Or the person that previously owned the item. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. and, and I think that, you know, saying that, Alistair, when we go in to do evaluation, and I know we're, we're putting on our website shortly the process that we go through. Again, that goes back to, so what purpose is it that we're doing for? But part of that process is actually sitting down with the client and understanding who the client is that we're doing evaluation for and understanding that lifestyle of the client that we're doing evaluation for. Because when you're placing value on jewellery or wardrobes, somebody sitting in a you know, two-bedroom cottage in, in Surrey may have a very different lifestyle to that person that's sitting in the £10 million um, mansion in London. And unless you can understand that client's lifestyle, it's very difficult to have those conversations. And that's why it's so important to go out and see your client. And I know most brokers try to, because it is so important, because unless you actually meet them, um, see that lifestyle, how can you gauge whether the figures that they're giving to you are correct if they haven't got a valuation? And it may be thought a thought process, oh, you know, there will be a level of underinsurance. That level of insurance can be huge. And as you and I know, we see so much of that. Um, and when somebody turns around to you and says, well, I'm not a jewelry person, that client not being a jewelry person and somebody of um, maybe wealthier uh, sort of position and not being a jewelry person are two very different things. Oh, it's, it's, it's astoundingly different. I mean, astoundingly different. I mean, the, 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 the term that I like to use most, I suppose, is establishing the true value, because the true value is an accurate reflection of what that client will need to replace that item in, in, in keeping with what their lifestyle consists of. Um, and also, we're talking about kind of what the valuer looks at. So as well as looking at the, the actual client. We were looking at, as you quite rightly pointed out, the previous owners as well. So the provenance of an item obviously is something that the valuer does have to look at in a lot of detail. And again, with provenance, um, it can often depend on the age of the piece. You know, so we're not just looking at things like makers and artists, um, but actually what has been the history of the piece? How old is it? Um, what condition is it in? Um, whether it's still in fashion even can affect value. There's so many things that actually do. And so for us, um, certainly if, if you look at David Dallas, who does our um, old masters, his can be very complicated. Um, and I think you and David... Yeah. Yeah. Talking about David and I have recently been, been working on, um, well, we, we work on very interesting cases on a week-to-week -week basis, which is fascinating. But I think the problem with art and old masters especially is that the way in which valuations are made, um, technology uh, changes, attributions change. And I've seen it on, on numerous occasions where previous attributions have then been downplayed or even sometimes completely said that they're wrong and I think you have to really really be very very careful about who has attributed it who has valued it and the way in which it's been put together and it, it, it's so volatile the way in which people actually look at valuations and I think this is this is quite a an interesting aspect I mean we could we could we could talk about you know David and I do unfortunately on a regular basis talk about it in length as to how these things change quite a lot but I think it's very important that if you're, if you're looking at old masters paintings, for example, anything over five or six, maybe seven or eight years old is almost irrelevant. And it sounds ridiculous, but it is true. I've seen paintings that have been very, very highly regarded and attributed by some of, you know, let's say the 1970s best experts in the 2000s. They've come along and said, no, completely wrong. And I think we're going to keep seeing that. But on the flip side of that, I think we are going to see things that are actually 
in terms of paintings, people look at things that have been not really considered to be of that much importance. And with the way that technology is moving, I think that there will be paintings that are newly discovered um, that, are, that are deemed to be very important. I think in, in, in paintings, it can be a lot more difficult because obviously there are leading authorities that will have confirmed a work is by the artist. And they may have gone through paint testing and thermolithographic um, uh, views of the work, all of which weren't available years ago. But obviously the leading authorities that we want to see, there may be a foundation that, that confirms the works. Um, we've had previously with an, an Indian work, we had the um, work actually confirmed by the daughter because yeah, but, uh, every work that her father had painted and there are fakes out there. When an attribution has changed, so what we mean by that is that it's previously sold as follower of, or attributed to, or even in the style of, that doesn't mean it's by the artist. And what you've got to remember is years ago, the, the artist would have a school. So um, where there was training taking place, so it will be that, you know, paintings were copied or in some cases I, I know and Alistair you're better on this than me but in some cases you may have had only the head was done by the artist and then his, his students would have done the rest of the work. Um, yeah there are, there are some rather I'm not going to be specific about paintings but there's one painting that I'm not going to name um, that probably everyone knows what it is where the hands in my opinion, are probably done by somebody else. Um, there, there are a lot of different things where that happens. Yeah. And it's, it's but, but that, but, but I mean, it's exactly the same as, and I hate to kind of use a really, really garish term, but if you're having a house built, somebody's going to be better at painting the windows and somebody's going to be better at painting <laughs> the walls. And that, that, that's how it works. And for example, with, with landscapes, you look at some old masters and some people were very, very good at trees. Some people were very, very good at streams. And if you've got that talent in your pool, then you'll use the best person for the best job. It's not always by the same person. And if you look ironically at some of the, the greats who actually did paint an entire painting, some of the aspects of it are a little bit lousy in comparison to some that were done by lesser known artists in, in, in those specific areas. So it's, but I think it's a funny one. That also takes us into specialists. And I bang on about specialists because they are important in a lot of significant areas. And we make sure we put the right team into a house. And again, when you're looking at an evaluation document that has been provided to you, you want to see who's been involved in that valuation. And when I'm given somebody else's valuation, it's the first thing that I do. I go to the back to see who has done it. And the reason that um, it's a bit like in the insurance world, you're getting somebody that maybe is very good on motor, suddenly writing a high risk sort of commercial uh, product. They may not have the skills or the qualifications. They may know a little bit, but they may not have enough. And that's really important in our world, is we want to see who's been involved in evaluation, who's done it. Um, the amount of times that I've met brokers and they've said, oh, um, I had somebody do evaluation, I should have used you. And I go, yes, yeah, she should have used me. Um, but I, I, you know, I use the local guy. Um, he's very nice, blah, blah, blah. And I totally get that because they may be cheaper. But cheaper isn't always best. And what you find out is actually his skill set, um, and I recall one um, that I remember a lot, is because a broker in Birmingham had used a guy I used to work with, and he said, I said, I turned around to him and said, oh, well, he must have had a great collection of furniture. And he said, no, actually paintings. And I went, oh, okay. He was a furniture specialist for 30 years. So what he knows about paintings is probably as much as I do on the back of a fag packet. But hey, there's the internet <laughs> and you can search or it may have a potential signature on it. But also, also I think the, a very, very important factor is, and um, I, I refer to a, a recent case 
um, that I was looking at where, where evaluation had been done. And the valuation had been done by somebody that was actually um, an antiques dealer. So they ran a shop and they were obviously interested in quite a lot of the, the items that were in the property. Um, so this valuation had been done. Everything completely downplayed to a point where I almost felt sick because it was just so wrong. And it was quite clear that it was from a, a, a certain situation where these items were, were due to be sold. And obviously, the, you know, the, 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 the valuer had put a value on these items and then made them an offer to actually buy the items. There, there were two 40 grand paintings in there that had been listed as you know, 500 pound prints or something along, I can't even remember, it was that bad. And the point is that when you're looking at valuations like that, you almost have to disregard them because either there's an ulterior motive behind the valuation or they just don't have the knowledge to actually you know, go there with it. Well, I think, again, that goes back to who's done it? Is it in their skill set? Who is the company that you've actually used? You want to see on a valuation document their So when, 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 we're talking, when we're talking about those documents, because that was something that we obviously we spoke about in the article and what it should actually look like. So obviously we, we, we should have the, the, the valuation company's name. And I'm assuming, Rachel, you know, you should be able to look them up and find out that they're reputable and go through that kind of process. Yeah, I, do you know what? Um, again, it's sort of one of my bees in my bonnet that it's not always done. And it may be as a company, you've always used these people or you've always used this guy. And it, you, he may be very nice. You know, I, all of our values are very nice and all the people I used to work with are very nice, but it may not be in their skill set. So you really need to be using somebody that's independent. Um, you need to know that they are a reputable business. And again, I'm always happy to, you know, give anything, anybody anything they want, if they want to see, they can see. Um, we regularly give copies of our PI insurance. Um, like any business, you have to have professional indemnity insurance. But it's what is that value? Um, because again, if you're valuing items for vast figures, which we do, you've got to have a cover that will equally represent that value should you do something wrong. Okay, somebody needs to actually confirm you have and, you know, touch wood and thank God nothing has ever happened to me like that. But, you, you know, should it happen or should you put a valuer in that doesn't know what he's doing, that it could come back on you. And I do know one specific um, where a broker had recommended a valuer, there was a claim, they didn't have enough PI insurance, so they actually went after the broker because right. of the recommendation. And, you know, I understand that brokers don't always have time to check out third parties, but that's what we are. We're a third party provider. We do a service for people um, allowing clients, so we're going into clients' homes, and you need to make sure that a third party just is the right person. It's not just because he's nice, or my mate referred him, or he's, you know, he's done a job for somebody else. It's, it really is checking them out. So if anybody wants copies of my PI insurance, I happily give it. Um, so I think a big, a big thing coming out of lockdown um and you know obviously with, with things changing I, I think a, a lot of it you know there will be a lot of kind of emphasis on on reputation and mm -hmm. reputation of brokers reputation of insurers and the reputation of values in the way in which they kind of dealt with certain difficult situations during this whole kind of kind of fiasco of a, of a, of a current pandemic but um, as, as you quite rightly say, the reputation falls on kind of us as valuers and in having that, you know. I mean, we're very lucky. We're recognised by most of the insurers and the insurers actually do um, make sure you've got your PI insurance. So, you know, we regularly work with the likes of Hiscox, um, Chubb, Cavea. Um, we do valuations for XL Catlin or AXA XL, but it can be often through the client. Um, we're very lucky with the brokers that we support, um, but it just is, again, something that you just need to check out. So not only are you sort of looking at that document that says who that company is, but you want to see that um, who the value is on there. You want to see that 
There's a full detailed description of the piece. There's photographs that identify the piece, because again, if you're under- It's still, it's still surprising me that I, I've seen valuations in, in the past few years that have been done in the past few years, where you're talking items that are, you know, not huge amounts of money, but 20, 30,000 pounds that don't have photographs. And you, you do start to wonder what, what possible reason could there not be to photograph these items? I started putting images in valuations in around about 2006. Hmm. Um, so that's really, if you're not seeing images, then really my advice would be a valuation should carry one um, because, again, it just confirms what the item is. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll come on it when we, when we look at the, the kind of the, when somebody suffers a loss. But again, the, 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 the key point of it is to be able to identify items. And I think that that's one of the, the most major kind of aspects of it. But we'll, we'll, do, we'll just finish first on, on the actual instructing of evaluation. So in terms of the, the, the firms that, you know, should be being used for these valuations, Rachel, um, we, we covered the insurance side of it. Um, I'm assuming T's and C's and rules of engagement obviously should be a fairly important factor before you decide what to do. I mean, we actually rewrote ours, um, uh, gosh, November last year, which was part of our insurance, actually. So terms and conditions are very important. Um, I'm very lucky that my other half is a lawyer, so um, I slightly get free legal advice. <laughs> but it does help that, you, you know, you need to make sure that those documents, every valuation that we confirm to a client, we send a copy of our terms and conditions. We also have service standards that we work to. So again, what as a client, you don't want a valuer going out there and then carrying it around in his briefcase for four or five weeks. Um, Jane, who- which, which, which we see, which we see. <laughs> <all the> <laughs> I, you wouldn't believe it. Boxing houses tend to be the worst. Um, but and again, because it's not their initial focus, you know, we are purely a valuation company where auction houses are basically looking to sell. And that's what they, they do. And that's, you know, they, they treat the data um, with that in mind as well, which is also maybe not appropriate. Um, but you know, we, we have service standards that we work to. We turn our valuations around within 20 working days to draft. Um, we will give a quote on every valuation that we go out to. I don't like surprises. I'm not a surprise kind of girl. Um, and I think our clients, certainly when money is involved, do not want to see a quote or an invoice that they didn't expect. It ruins a relationship you know, and it's just not worth it. So hence we go out to large valuations, we'll go on pre, um, meet the client, have a chat, work out all those questions that we need answering in preparation for evaluation. Um, but also, you know, we make sure we give a full quote so everybody knows what. what. Um, but I think that's part of the process. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm a process person. I'm not a valuer, I'm a process. And I think that that's what's key to maybe no, no. Have. An, an unfortunate part of the process that we probably need to lead on to is that doomsday scenario where the worst does actually happen and you need to make the claim. So where does evaluation come into play when you have to make a claim and you do suffer a loss? Now, bear in mind, Alistair, me and you are not insurers. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't always answer this um, from an insurance perspective, but certainly with regards to a client, a client will then hopefully have already given their valuation to their broker. So the broker will have a full detail of what that risk looks like. And then those figures will then help be able to um, agree a settlement claim. Also, again, photographs are involved. So I've had clients before that have had jewellery break-ins and they've asked for copies of the images and actually we've helped them. We've sent them up to whether it's the art loss register or there is actually a watch one as well. Yeah. Um, so we can help or whether we give them to the client for the police. So very much it's part of that whole process, but it does give a true value of what the broker needs to or the insurer needs to pay out on. 
I think as well, if a client has had a valuation, even if it's five years old, 10 years old, it should state what it is and it should state a value. So even if we had to go back in time to help a loss adjuster come up with a value, the fact that a valuation has been done at all will help. Um, and we have, done that. we have had to do that in the past, unfortunately, and it, it's one of those scenarios. But I think as it, it almost shows, I mean, we have to go, kind of go back to the proof of ownership kind of thing. And we'll talk about online valuations and things like that in a moment. But I think the, 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 the proof of ownership, really, um, I go to look at a, a client's collection of, let's say, for the sake of argument, and we'll talk about a, a, a webinar I did not so long ago about watches. Let's say I go and look at a, a collection of watches. I can, I can say that I've seen all of those watches in the client's possession. They're photographed in the client's home. And I'm sure to insurers, that is some form of reassurance. Absolutely. I mean, the amount of times that we will use a previous valuation and you'll go and um, value it. And one, the item isn't what it said it's supposed to be. And um, we did a embassy in London um, about a year ago where the painting was actually a huge amount better than what it had been classed as previously. Yeah, so that could have caused a problem. Um, Just kind of like that, strangely to talk about embassies, I won't mention anything specifically, but I, I, I've been involved in, in, in situations whereby large organisations such as that may not actually have those things in that specific office anymore. They've been moved and you look at the valuation and in fact things from other offices or things from other embassies potentially have been moved in and out of buildings um, and they don't accurately know what's there because it's been so long since the last one that they can't really tell what's there and what's not there. And obviously they can't look at a painting and go, oh, that's such and such. That's what it is on the, the, you know, the rundown. It's, um, yeah. it's a tricky one. I think again with Mary, um, Mary and James who do our jewellery valuations, they will often be given at a valuation a GIA certificate or a, or a diamond certificate. Now, every diamond has etched on the part of the diamond um, the number of the GIA of the certificate and you have to match those two pieces together. And the amount of times Mary has got a diamond certificate that actually has nothing to do with the ring that she's valuing. Now you can't see that in a in a um, online valuation. You know, you also can't see there's a big chunk out of it, or you know. And dare I say it, our our valuers not only value, but they're using all their senses. So you know, one you get a gut reaction when you're move when you're going in to meet the client if something's wrong or something's not quite right or mm, this kind of feels a bit, mm, you know, what's going on here? What reason are we coming into value even? But also you use your smell, you know, your eyes and you, you do get a, a reaction to things. Um, so it's, it's so important that we do handle and turn things upside down and See that there's a very nice Chinese vase that maybe the client had bought for 45,000 but suddenly has a huge big chunk out of it, you know, or whatever. These are, these are things that you, you can only see with the naked eye. You can't see through a camera. And as much I mean, as I, thing, I think with, with online valuations, the way in which they're, they're set up is you, you're, you can send pictures in and there, 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 is, there is a space for them. And I think, you know, you can use them to assess what you need to do with an item. But if you've got two photos of a vase that's being valued at 50,000 pounds, let's say, from a good angle, you can make it look great. From a bad angle, you can make it look terrible. What, you know, you can almost dictate what value you want from it by how you take the photographs. You know, I mean, dur just, during lockdown, we've been doing online yeah. evaluations because we've had to. Um, I, I, am, I am not a huge fan at all and, you know, um, Mary, because she is a registered valuer, she is unable um, under her, uh, her professional body to actually value online. Okay. You know, she won't do it at all. Um, and I think, again, you know, we do need to see items, but 
if, if the only way of actually achieving this is by doing a desktop, then, then yes, we'll help because we'd rather give brokers, you know, a line in the sand and give them a valuation rather than no valuation at all. Um, so again, we're always really keen to help. And again, we've been doing valuations, you know, with videos where clients have been walking around the house. That then tells you if you need to see something because again, and it can be dictated by value. But I think a lot of things that I've done, for example, um, with the video, some of the video ones that we've done, they've been fantastic because also you have the way of actually kind of establishing that the person's kind of spending habits just through the way you speak to them on, on, you know, through video. However, you catch something out of the corner of your eye that they haven't really thought about and you think, right, okay, I need to look at that in person. And I think it's a great way of establishing what you need to do. There are certain circumstances where if it's of limited value and of limited, and I hate to use the term interest because every, every client is of interest, um, but you can do a lot more. But when it comes to things like, look, we talked about old masters paintings and things like that, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's an impossibility to even expect to do things online. And so when you have firms that are saying, you know, I mean, ultimately what an online valuation kind of firm would do effectively is is check sales results which everyone does but they don't look at the quality of the actual piece and that's the that's my big bugbear is anyone can you know find out results and sales results and that's what you would base a, you know it, it seems almost we're like working for argos you take a measurement you take a maker and then you work it out through through an algorithm and that's not that's not art and antiques at all I think, I think as well, it's often that we're doing it on the back of information that has been provided by the client. And how many times do we know when the client actually doesn't, they haven't got it right. So you, you know, any valuation is, is clearly on that basis. Um, and it will state it's been, you know, from, from information provided by the client. And I think an online valuation needs to be very clear that that's the case. Um, especially when a broker is, is taking it, because it often is a cheaper option, you know, and as we went said earlier, cheap is not necessarily always the right thing. And they could be getting it wrong, you know, um, and the client could actually lose out because of it. Oh, so so I would so always so. be cautious. I would always be cautious. Brilliant. Right. Well, we've, uh, We've kind of, I think, broached quite a lot of the subjects that we uh, we went through on on the article, and I hope that answers a lot of questions. As, as well, we the out, only one I was going to say, Alistair, is obviously once we've done a valuation and we've seen items, it's a lot easier to do a revaluation as a yeah. desktop because we have actually seen them, and we do obviously manage collections as well with clients, especially in the art arena, where we're adding things to our valuations as they're purchasing. So again, we would then review it next time that we go and see, but we do manage collections. Um, if you've got a valuation where you think the client could be out, we did one recently where um, a broker sent me a valuation asking if we could have a look at it, had there been any changes in values. I sent it off to James and he chose three items within a, there was about 50 in total, but he chose three items that he gave huge discrepancies in the values from the early evaluation. So I think the question was, sorry, I'm rambling. The question was, is evaluation needed? So if you've got a client that doesn't think there has been an increase or wants to broad brush, a, you know, let's put it up by X percent, it doesn't work because everything is different. Everything will be affected by value. You could have two rings, same cut, same clarity. One can be by graph and the other one can be by a nobody. So again, it, it could have a different effect on the value. Um, so if you have got valuations that you'd like us to have a look at, that we can sort of say, yes, you do need to, you know, get it updated because here's an example, items three, seven and nine. These are the increases. We're more than happy to do that. Anything that we can help, we, we will. Um, <laughs> Rachel, I've had a question that's come in from the floor here um, and asking, how do I base the cost of each valuation? Okay, so we quote on a time basis. Um, you never want your clients paying for valuations on a percentage of value. It's so wrong and shouldn't be done. And it 
it creates people to put higher values than what is necessary. So we charge purely on time. We look at what it is that we're valuing because again, if we're going in to do an old master, there can be more research that's been needed off site than on site. But because we charge on a time basis, we would quote how many pieces, um, what it is that is being valued, and then we would give a quote for that. So with jewellery, you're sort of looking sort of between five and seven items an hour. Uh, our fees are £175 per hour, um, plus some nominal travel expenses and plus VAT. Uh, we have a minimum of two hours on site. Um, but again, it may be that because there's only 20 paintings, you only need a painting specialist for three hours, but you've got um, 100 pieces of jewellery, so you're there for two days. So it all depends on, on what it is, which is why we quote for each job. So clients know, one, the time that they're going to have to give evaluation, because again, that's really important. And, and how, you know, what our specialist is going to need with regards to our site work, if any is involved. So again, multi-gem sets can be more complicated with jewelry than a diamond that we have a GIA certificate for, because again, we're sort of using that one to check they're both the same, and then we will use that information. So each valuation can be different depending on what's involved. So um, brokers that have ever asked me for a quote, they probably wonder why I'm asking all this, you know, why does she need to know that? You know, and again, when a broker says to me, oh, they've got um, 300,000 pounds worth of paintings, can you tell me how long it's gonna take? It doesn't matter about value, it's about what it is and how many, and that's when we can quote. Always happy to give a quote, always happy. And I was gonna say, always happy to talk to people. Yeah, about and again, that. hourly rates. Uh, when I get a client that phones me that says to me, oh, what's your day rate and what's your hourly rate? I say, it doesn't mean anything. I said, because you're gonna look at whoever else has quoted and use that basis and it's not based on that because they may take three days where we'll only take two so you really do need a detailed proposal quote who's doing it we give bios of every one of our specialists doing evaluation so the client knows who they are and what their qualifications are and whilst we're on the subject of uh, doing things so we're now getting close to June the 1st, and thankfully, um, with the current situation, um, it appears like we're, we're coming back, Rachel. We are. Um, I'm delighted to say that we've got inquiries in, and I'm starting to book appointments. We're being terribly careful. You know, we realise how serious the, this is, and we're going to be going through testing with our um, valuers, which we're doing next week. Um, Yes, things can change on a day-to-day -day basis, but we, we're very keen that they go through that. Uh, we will be wearing masks and we'll be wearing gloves and we'll have sanitizer. We're not going to be using public transport, so we will be having a conversation with the client over that. You know, do they have parking? Um, we will phone you when we're outside the property to let us in. We'll have a conversation the day before to take them through the process to ask all those questions that we need to ask prior to arrival. Um, we understand that you know, it's very delicate and we've got to go through that process. We'll be asking clients if they've got jewelry to lay it out on the table prior to us arriving. So we gain, we don't have to get very close. Um, we'll probably ask for a glass of water to be left somewhere. But apart from that, that's it. We, you know, we're totally self-sufficient um, and we'll be taking clients through the process but no, I'm, I'm pleased to say that um, we have got inquiries and we're slowly filling the diary, which is really nice to see. So no. But I think just, just to reinforce your point, Rachel, I think we, you know, we, we've spoken about this at length and I think obviously that the most important thing is, is the safety of not only our valuers, but our clients and making sure that everyone is completely comfortable and knows what we're gonna be doing when we go into um, a property. I mean, obviously, 
in, in you know in, in previous times we've we've turned up and, and talked them through once we've arrived at the front door and I think what will happen now is as you quite rightly said a phone call will be made before we arrive and a phone call will be made after we've left and a lot of the the face-to-face -face interaction will possibly be via video call or possibly via phone where we can actually ask the questions that don't need to be asked whilst we're there and we'll minimize the amount of time that we're actually in the property but it won't it won't kind of do any damage to the actual valuation because a lot of the time that we do spend in the property usually is actually talking to the client. And again, I think it, you know, depending on what we've quoted, I mean, we've uh, got a job that we're literally trying to work out at the moment because it's got a team of four people. And it's, do we actually do it separately? Do we send two in one day, two in another day? And again, it's working out with the client, what are they happy with? You know, um, we're doing a jewelry evaluation for a client and she said to me, oh, don't worry, I'll just sit in the garden. You know, uh, I've got cleaners at my house today. You know, they're being let in. Um, so you, you, we can find ways. What we're not wanting to do is to obviously put people at risk. And we're certainly not wanting to frighten anyone wearing masks. So we will be wearing masks. But when you're in your own, on your own, then you can be. Um, you can at least remove it and put, push it down. But when you're in, with somebody, make sure that you've got your face covered. So we're, we're going to be taking all those guidelines and hope that brokers will support us getting us back, getting us earning some money, <laughs> getting us out there. <laughs> but no, very, very keen to get back. So and again, and again <laughs> just to, to, make, to, make, to make the point again, is the fact, you know, we're always at the end of a telephone. If you, if anything specific, we're always more than happy to have a chat about it and try and work out, you know, bespoke solutions to actually what your clients need. So I think that about wraps it up for today, Rachel. So thank you very much indeed. Um, and again, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we, we thank you for attending. We're always here. So yes. cool. Stay safe. Bye. We're all very excited to get back, um, as I say. However, as I mentioned earlier, we're we'll going to be continuing doing this series of webinars after this. So do get in touch if there's anything you'd like to be covered. So thanks again. We'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.